Hello, I'm Graham Fitch coming to you from Steinway Hall in London and in this particular video I'm going to answer questions that Pianist Magazine readers have sent in for me. Um, specific questions about specific pieces as it happens on this particular one. And Ed has written in asking about the repeated octaves in the right hand of Schubert's Erlkönig, Earl King. It's particularly difficult to, to manage this. Uh, let me see if I can do it. <laughs> too bad I think I could probably tighten that up a little bit but uh, let's let's go with that for a moment now what's difficult about it is repeated notes can tend to cause us tension because we stick in one spot um, if you want to solve this problem there are two things you've got to do one is to find a spot in the octave G where you don't have to release the key um, it's thanks to our wonderful double escapement mechanism that Sebastian Erard invented it means that I don't have to lift the key. Do you hear what I'm doing there? Can you see what I'm doing? I'm staying in, in the bottom part of the key in the repetitions. That's only part of the story though. What I need to do is to use a, a movement in my arm. I, 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 I feel it as a wave. I put a wave in my arm. See what's going on there? Let me do it slowly. See, now, now, I've, I, now I'm feeling coordinated with that, and I could go on, I promise I won't because it's boring, but I could go on for a long time with that repeated octave and not feel any tension at all. Let me just show you how I would suggest you, you build that. Um, let's, let's try it in this way first. Let's try and find two or three or, or more different spots on the surface of the key. See what I'm doing? I'm going in, then I'm coming out. Now you'll notice that on my journey in and out, I'm also coming up in my wrist and in my forearm so that I've got, it's actually this range of movement that I'm using here. Now to build it in, okay, what I'd suggest you do is to, just to start off, if you want to do this really systematically, start off with just drops into each note. From the key surface, drop, drop. Now build in one drop and two releases. Down, up, up, down, up, up. Do you see what I'm doing there? Down, up, up, down, up, up. So I'm measuring the, the movement quite precisely. Now I'm going to suggest this. St stage three um, would be to have three in the down position and then three in the up position. Down, up, down, up. Then try this. It's worth doing this, even though you're probably not going to stay down for this long. Six down, six up. Down, up, down, up. Actually, that would probably be uh, very useful to you to do threes, then sixes. Then allow yourself to feel free to do what is what comes out. Now my demonstration, although I say so myself, has improved <laughs> from the first time I played it to just now, from having measured those movements quite carefully, quite precisely. Um, that's how to manage repeated notes generally, well certainly repeated chords or octaves. I hope that's answered your question, Ed. We had a, also a, a question about the tremolo in the Pathetique Sonata. Um, let me just play you the beginning of the beginning of the, the, the allegro. We're all familiar with that spot. The very first thing to say about the tremolo is that it's measured. It's not a free for all. It's not just, you know, tremolo as fast as you can. It's absolutely precisely measured. If I did it in slow motion, to what you'd discover is that every time I play a a beat in my right hand, it's my fifth finger in the left hand that's marking the beats. So what I'd suggest you did first would be to hold down the thumb in the left hand. You can put the key down silently before you begin and just play the pinky notes in the left hand together with the right hand. Now 
know, it, for the second line, you'd, you'd need to play octave, pinky, octave, pinky. Do you see what I'm doing there? Because Beethoven's now moving uh, the left hand around. That's the first thing I'd do. You could even omit the thumb completely. For practice uh, until you can do that beautifully coordinatedly. Um, one last thing, the mechanic of the left hand is going to be a rotation that we experience from the forearm. I'm showing you here on my sleeve so that you can see what happens. The movement is free from here, there's no up-down movement from the elbow, the elbow stays in one spot and I rotate like this. Um, now of course the movement becomes smaller uh, when, I, when I play faster. If you haven't experienced that movement, um, or you want to lubricate the movement, what I suggest you could do would be, again, in, similar to what I was telling you about that, the actual piece, but to make an exercise, first of all, just for the left hand. The thumb first. Do you see the rotation? And then to the pinky. What you can do is to, to make a, a division of, of three, one and a two and, a, or one, two, three, four, five, six. And practice a C minor scale. Do you hear what I've got there? A very controlled tremolo. First of all, the pinky has the accent and then the thumb has the accent. Now you may wonder why am I getting you to do accents on the thumb when in the Beethoven example there are no thumb accents, the accents are all fifth fingers. I believe it's a very useful uh, to, uh, thing to do to ground both the pinky and the thumb rhythmically before we go ahead and do the rotation, uh, the, the tremolo uh, as, as um, in, in the Beethoven example. If you watched my demonstration on symmetrical inversion. There's nothing to stop you doing that. Again, uh, a mirror image in the right hand. It doesn't have to be precise mirror image. It could just be... There's a good exercise for tremolos in general. I hope that's answered your question about that. Last question I had was from Joyce. Um, and she says, after I tried practicing Czerny, opus 740, number eight, 740, that's, that's quite a number, um, using forearm rotation, I still felt my left arm was tight. I would appreciate knowing if there are any other ways to fix it. Well, it's always difficult to, to diagnose a problem uh, without having seen the, the person's playing. But if I can just give you a few thoughts on, on, on um, oh, I've lost my slide, let me go back. So a few thoughts on what this might be. Um, let's have a look at this piece. I'll do it, again. let me show you in slow motion first. I probably want a little pedal with that. Maybe a little pedal here. Very little actually. Um, let's just go through this a little bit. I'm gonna start somewhat perversely with the right hand, because I have found that studies that focus on one hand, uh, people learn them with no attention to what's going on in the other hand, when actually the right hand is all important to the presentation of this piece. Let me just show you the right hand. Again, I'm using a chord legato there to make joins where I can, I can't always. And again, I'm shaping the line so that I I listen to the foreground, which is the, the right hand. The difficulty is in the accompaniment. So if I've got uh, no foreground, how can I expect my background to feel good and, or sound good? Now, getting to the, the nitty gritty of what's involved in this, this left hand, we do have rotations here, but there's something you've got to be aware of. Let me just show you the rotation slowly. What you'll, what you'll notice is the octave rotation. Let me just repeat the octave a few times. Now when I play my second finger, I need to remember one really important thing, which is not to keep the pinky out 
ready for the next bass note. It's tempting to keep it there, so we think I'm going to need the B next, so let me be on the B. This may be what you're doing, Joyce, I don't know, but it, it's possible that if, if you keep your pinky over the next note that it's going to be, be called to play, which is the B, no matter how, how, you, how much you want to, you're going to be building tension into your hand. Do you see what happens when I play my second finger? And I'll show you here. The pinky comes in, closes up. The hand closes up. So a good uh, first stage would be to practice stopping on the second finger. And as you stop on the second finger, just make sure you're loose. You could even do that hands together. Close. Yeah. You can, of course, use different rhythms to practice the left hand, uh, the traditional ones. Stopping on the pinky. Do that stopping on the thumb as well. Close. See how my hand's closing up? And then stop on the second finger, which we've done. And then stop on the last thumb. Slightly less useful, that, that particular one. Um, I hope that's answered your question. Start with the right hand and really make sure you've got a wonderful right hand and then work very systematically on the left hand. Just to recap, make sure you close your hand up between the uh, thumb and the second finger. I hope that helped you. Well, I've certainly enjoyed doing that. I hope you got something from it. Um, if you have any particular questions that you'd like me to address in one of these videos, do feel free to get in touch with me. What you'll need to do is to contact our lovely editor, Erica Worth, at Pianist Magazine, and here's the address on the screen for you now.